Thank you very much. So welcome everyone here for this last session. I know it's the last session between me and Fun. So I'm glad you're here. We close the door so no one can leave and you stay. But I hope you can get something out of it. Um, it's not hacking systems now. It's hacking the human operating system. I actually prepared a big entry like, why did I do social engineering and all that stuff and these things. But now in this setting, it kind of came to me. You know, I haven't been in this setting for a long time, in the evening. But no, it was back then, maybe, oh, that's a nice girl. Oh, she's a girlfriend. Then you go back. So social engineering, it's in every one of us. It's our program, how our mind works. And it's sometimes astonishing how it works and how it doesn't work. So I selected a couple of things I wanted to highlight to you for today's session, and I hope you can pick up on some parts of it and maybe even use it. So today's session is actually not about me, it's about you, <laughs> because I want to contribute to you, what you do, what you can use in your daily life or in your job, and give you away some of the things I have done. I do information security stuff, or security stuff, I can say. Google knows me. And there is Twitter. I don't do much there. I'm not so of an online guy. Um, or as my mother-in-law once said, right, you work with uh, computers. Can you please carry the printer inside and connect it? I said, yes, of course. I work with computers. That's my work, stuff I do. So what I do is I protect my clients. You see a couple of them here as representatives from this wherever it is required. That's the work I do. I spent of a couple of years in Australia. I have done some work in Asia, in the US, and all over the place. Information security stuff. Big and small engagements, and with all sorts of edge to security, I guess. Now, what's the definition of social engineering? There are actually many definitions out there, and none of them really fit. So we found for us, it's important to create a common understanding for social engineering. It's also, if you do work in your field, most important is to create a common language. If you work with clients, with other colleagues, whatever you do, if you don't talk the same language, you get in trouble. Some talk about segregation, some talk about VLANs, some talk about zoning. They maybe all mean the same, but maybe not. So this is our definition of social engineering. It's the elicitation of information from systems, networks or human beings from all these three areas. We want to collect information as social engineers from people through method and tools. We wanted to have a controlled approach in obtaining information. It's information, as I say, usually I do also some work with uh, Hacker High School for kids and stuff like that. So. It's always very hard to get to know people what information means and if it has a value or not. But the most important thing is always data is an asset. If you remember this, you will be fine. That's basically it. Data is an asset means your forename is an asset. Your phone number is an asset. Your address is an asset. Where you live, your laptop, your SSID, your system handle, all this is an asset and has value. And it's like with hacking. That's why we have these tools, like ArcSight, for instance. If you have an event here and an event here three months later, a human being cannot correlate what has happened between those two. It's the same things with your assets. You give away your name once, then you give away your street there and the rest here. You cannot correlate. That's also what social engineering does. They just pick pieces here and the piece there and the piece there. And then at the end, you have the full picture for whatever you need to do with it, right? So that's just the definition which gives you an idea what this actually means. It's not bad or good. It's not valuating, right? We don't say you steal classified information because most of the information is not classified you steal as a social engineer. But if you combine and correlate the information, then it's becoming interesting. Why is social engineering as an APT so underestimated? 
I think that's one of the biggest problems and also a driver why we do, me, my colleague in Germany, we actually started this framework. It is us underestimated because there is no software or hardware you can buy. There is not a box or an appliance or something else you can buy. It protects you from social engineering, right? There is no firewall, gateway, data leakage prevention tool, whatever. You cannot buy something really tangible to protect you from social engineering. And actually, I'm glad you can't because otherwise it's a device which you don't really like to install on yourself, right? But also, I think social engineering as an APT doesn't have its own logo, <laughs> right? So it's really kind of, is it a real vulnerability if it doesn't have its own logo? I don't know, maybe. Like the other serious ones, right? Because only serious vulnerabilities have logos, right? So that's this one. And uh, you wouldn't believe, but uh, the second bullet point is actually true. I worked with those vulnerabilities when they came out for my clients. So there was a big mess. Okay, do you have an asset register? Where are your machines? Are they affected or not? When can we update them? Who's paying for the update? Is the SLA still in place, etc., etc. And then, a couple of weeks later, there were new vulnerabilities coming out. And I was doing this kind of uh, strategic advices on vulnerabilities, etc. And then there was a vulnerability without the logo. And I got this ask, hey, Dom, is that also a dangerous one? It has no logo. I said, hell yes, it's even more dangerous than the other one. But it has no logo. So what do you do, right? I think also what's in <laughs> interesting here, that's the human mind playing around this, is you get 10% more budget if your vulnerability has a logo <laughs> to fix it. Really, it's true. You know, if management sees a logo and they report, oh my God, heart bleed, look, it looks like this. So dangerous, blood ugh, coming out. You get 10% more budget to fix it. And also what's interesting, if you fix finally one of these ones in the company, you patched everything, etc. you run a new scan and say, oh, yes, we done it, you're the hero. So you not only get 10%, but also you get the hero bonus for fixing it. That's what's happening with the logo. But as I said, I'm thinking always ahead, and I'm thinking ahead of problems and how you can solve them. It's like Harvey Specter in Suits. There are 146 things you can do when someone points a gun to your head, right? So I created this logo. You can say, logos, who cares? Social engineering, forget about it. It's not important. It's not even real coding there. So I created social engineering logos, but also I created them to get a 10% bonus and the hero status, right? Now you can use them. I, um, maybe you can hack them from me or social engineer them from me or we will make them available on the website for you. You can download them. But I also use them for planning. Social engineering is also about planning, playing attack vectors, looking for vulnerabilities, and when you have a logo, you can actually make some nice maps. So you pick out the person, and then you say, okay, now there, geographically, we go fishing. There, geographically, we go whaling. We want to have this guy, or spearfishing or whatever. So it's actually also for attack planning, quite useful, but also to show management, hey, we need more budget to fix this, right? Then some facts about social engineering, which I think are important too. So I do as a hobby or kind of my work and get paid for it, that's nice. Also, um, I do some reverse engineering, not technically. I can't code, that's why I became a social engineer, right? No, um, <laughs> every large attack has some social engineering components in it. If you look at Carbonac, the banking attack, it wasn't that famous in the news, maybe, but money-wise, it was really interesting. But from the bank side, who cares? A couple of hundred million, really minor. But if you look at the attack, there is a social engineering element in the middle where they actually try to look at keyboard typing, password typing, and everything else. 
Without that little bit in the middle of the whole attack chain, it wouldn't have been so successful. I don't say it wouldn't be successful. What I'm also saying is hacking is a business. We knew that before, right? But <laughs> therefore, business principles apply, and you have to think like that, like a professional business. You want to have something in return. And also from a socioeconomic point of view, hacking a person is much cheaper than evading encryption or two-factor authentication, for instance. So what I do expect is for the future that there will be much more social engineering in the attack chain. And it's cheaper. And if it doesn't work, who cares? You create another attack chain. But so it means from my view, looking at social engineering and protecting my clients, you need to be aware. You need to be aware as a CISO, you need to be aware as the IT responsible, as the CEO, as a, an administrator, as yourself, <laughs> right? Because your reputation is maybe on the line. So be aware of this. It becomes more important. And it's so easy to make any faults in this area without realizing. I think that's an important bit the link down here is actually from a very interesting movie from the Switzerland the Federal Intelligence Service about industrial espionage. They call it short movie and it's 20 minutes, okay? But it's really interesting. There's some social engineering techniques in there. How actually an industrial client gets hacked. He's a book author and then some person is approaching him and saying, yeah, we can offer you a contract and give you a contract with, you know, France and we can get you good reviews and all that stuff. So it's actually really good made. If you are in awareness or something for your company, go to that link and look at it. It's a great, great video. It also gives you a bit about the topic of uh, social engineering. Now. What are social engineers? They're not just the unskilled little brother of real hackers, okay? <laughs> they have feelings too. <laughs> they love, right? And what do they love? They love ducks. They love turtles. And they love pineapples. I see some already make the link there, right? Is it a riddle? Yeah, it's kind of a riddle, okay? What do I mean by that? They do love land turtles. They do love USB rubber duck here and do, do love pineapple nano. It's not a product endorsement, okay? These are tools you can use. And these are tools commercially available, easy to use. You know, you can drop shells everywhere. It's like a, an injection tool. And the nano, it just gives you what you want. Isn't that the best thing that ever happens to you, you know? If someone gives you what you want, so the Nano is so friendly, it gives you the SSID you want. It gives you the SSID you're promoting, your access point. They're so friendly products. So that's actually what I mean by fruits and animals, right? So maybe you're connected to one right now. Sometimes at conferences or other places, you really say, leave everything at home. I say, take everything with you to the conference. And look what's going on there yourself. Then often you see people walking around, backpacks and a ten of like this, going up, right? And what do they do? Oh, they're just friendly. They help you get access. So don't be always so wary with these things. You can trust them. But no, that's also a problem which I think is careful from the perspective of how do you conduct yourself? You know, do you really want to show your access point? What's the point of showing it? Yeah, it's fun, it's kind of, is it ego feeding? Yeah, maybe. Do you want to provoke reactions? Well, of course. Do you want to provoke reactions? Maybe. So it's always kind of um, the approach what you want to do. So my approach for this is, uh, I just bought today, I always try to combine work and pleasure. So I bet a chocolate croissant today. You know, I have a train, general abonnement, can drive around everywhere. Quite funny, I can eat my chocolate croissant and then put it on the table. That's much better than seeing antennas. Because look, it just needs a bit of conceal. It looks like this, you know. You don't need to show antennas. Maybe you're connected to one right now. It's a very good access, just connect to it. So these are the nice things. 
social engineers use too to get their information or what they want. So what do you do if you're connected to such a device or thing? First, don't panic. You're in good hands with the social engineer, right? So he will help you. You can relax. You have someone with competence on your side. What do you do next? Second, don't remove this device. If some device is connected to your laptop, to your desktop, whatever, right? You don't want to break anything because you have to tell your IT department, I have broken something. So just leave it there yet. Then next, third, safely remove it and plug it to your CEO's laptop or best friend's laptop because you get rid of the problem and that's a principle what's called shared responsibility. Everyone should get a fair share of this, right? And you can be proud of you. You didn't have to involve help desk. And fourth, connect to the following website, www.don'tgetme. Enter your credentials, all of them, social security number, credit card, logins, etc. Because if you don't do, we cannot tell you if you are safe. Okay? If you miss a credential or a social security number or a credit card number, the guys from WW don't get me can tell you if you are safe. So put all of the information in, then you will know you are safe or if you are compromised or not. And thank you for cooperation, you will hear from us. That's what social engineers do. They do the same thing as hacking, but they are nice with it, okay? So, there's another problem with social engineering. And I think it's a general problem, but it becomes especially um, concentrated for social engineering. This is how we see, or I see, the social engineering landscape today. We do have heroes and what I call naturals, okay? The heroes are the one who just can do something. It's maybe the mitniks, it's maybe the others, right? They're heroes, they're social engineering heroes. They do social engineering, I don't know. Not every social engineer that's in jail can do a consulting company after that, but that's the heroes. But then also you have the naturals. They're kind of natural, they can talk their way out of everything, right? You maybe know some of your friends who are like that. They can talk their head off, they can do this, they can order free there, enter here, whatever. These are the naturals and the heroes. Usually when you have a new, a new topic or a new challenge in whatever area, you get those two first, kind of. They are important for these topics to evolve or to get the topic recognized. But there's a problem with them, the slight problems. There are none of those guys available, okay? Heroes and naturals. They don't have clearance. PSP, secret, whatever. They are sort of manageable. Think about those guys. Can you manage them in a professional setting? Can you say this is your work you have to do? Fly to Sydney, fly to Dubai, execute this job and come back? They're not that easy manageable. So you cannot really use them. They work for themselves or can bring a topic further. They don't have a structured and a repeatable approach because it's natural to them or it's a hero. They may not even be able to tell you what they do and why does it work. It just works for them. From a professional view, that's bad, right? It doesn't bring you further. It, you cannot protect your company with this. You cannot do engagement on social engineering with this. And the last point, <laughs> I'm afraid I have to tell you, they usually, they don't want to work for you. <laughs> that's also a bad point. So that's also, we felt, look, there must be something we could structure social engineering, make it available for everyone, show you how it works, where the pain points are. You can do then go different roads. You can go to the dark side do social engineering, you can go this way, execute yourself or protect yourself from social engineering. That's where we come along with the book. It just looks like this, not very spectacular. Then here you can take out your phones or your pen because 
there's a link. You can also click on it, right? No, really, it's a good link. So, but you never know. <laughs> so punch in this free code, and then you can download the free copy of the whole book because everything I will tell you today, except from a couple of sites, will be in there. The only thing you have to punch in first name, last name. Don't care about this, but you have, a, have to have a valid email address, at least. Now, social engineer do also other things, like, as I said, they wanted to try how the brain works. I will show you a QR code just in a second. How the brain works and make things easy. So now, imagining you are in a spa or in a sauna or whatever place in a whirlpool, and you need to remember something. The lottery figures are on the wall over there. And you have 10 seconds. What do you do? You don't have technology. You have nothing with you. The only thing protecting you from getting the big lottery win is your brain. So you can work on this. Social engineers always think how the brain works. So try to remember this. There are some people who just can do it. You know, you cover it, they will tell you. But for the others, try to remember. I give you a hint like mnemonic works. So 4-O-N is like moron. You know, moron, but it's 4 on. LL is little lover. And C, 6X is maybe like C sharp, but C sex. So 4 on little lover, C sex. I think you can remember this, right? And then you have it. And the rest is something like rep intelligence and cells. And you will have it. But I will give you the, the QR code. I'm not sure if it works. You can try. Make your pic picture out of it. It's the URL or make a photo and you can later make a photo of the picture and get to the link. So let's go further. This is how the book is structured, what everything is in there. Social engineering, the framework. This is more targeted if you want to do social engineering engagements with your guys or your company. A bit about governance, risk, compliance. I think very important from my point of view is intensity levels. We will cover them. Approach selection mode that is new. Attack vector development. I put uh, quite an emphasis on this one today. Interpersonal distance. Some information about that one. Verbal masking and experimental content. That's just the chapters of the book. So we'll go through a couple of things here with you now. That's basically the framework. So from a knowledge point, it's broad and specific. The framework covers GRC++, methods, instructions, and you have a skills area. Skills is really where you develop yourselves or the work you bring into the table. Some of the methods, the method is explaining you how you do certain things, and instruction is like a step-by-step. -step. Some of the methods and instructions don't need additional skills, right? And some of them need but you will see later what I mean by that. This is the GRC++. GRC, as you may know, is a governance risk compliance. Everyone talks about it on the carpet floor, what's important, what is governance, what is risk, etc. So, but GRC was, from my view, not enough for social engineering engagements. If you do vulnerability assessments, you maybe know the pain of working on terms and conditions, right? What do you scan? Where do you scan? Do you scan and exploit? Do you exploit and not scan? Or what the hell ever, right? It's really a pain. And it's very stressful for the companies as well because they don't know. The problem is they really have to trust you with that. So GRC is a topic there, but I added certain elements which are really important for social engineering. Because sometimes you hear things like, oh, there's a get out of jail letter. You know, you do a social engineering engagement, you get the job, you get a confirmation from the company saying you're allowed to social engineer, blah, blah, blah. But then you're on your own. Then you try to enter a company, maybe physically, through a reception desk. Now in Switzerland, the problem is reception desks are not the company's reception desk. That's a separate company, right? If you get caught trying entering there, they won't be nice to you. And your letter, get out of jail letter, is worse, not the paper it's written on, because they don't care. They have a contract, a professional obligation to the company to do their services for. These companies are known to be secure. 
And they will also never let you get away with it because that's their reputation. We are the company who's protecting the entrance of this company. So that's things you need to understand. That's why there are more levels you need to consider for social engineering. I got some feedback about this. <laughs> Here it says, the feedback was, don't bore hackers with this, they will die. Yeah, they're still on their chairs. So won't talk about this, forget it, right? Some of it, culture, don't overdo it. I was listening to that. Ethics, not much use at the hackers conference. Skip that, so we'll probably talk about those two. Right. Go to the intensity levels. That's a part we worked quite a bit, and it comes out of a lot of engagements I have done internationally. There's always the point of, what do you exactly do? What do you do if you go to Thailand and hack the site, or if you do pen testing over there? And that's always a communication between you and your client. That's why we brought up these intensity levels, because you define those and discuss it with your client. One to three green, four to six orange, red, and black. Risk-based, it's very easy, right? Green is okay, orange is not so okay, red is bloody fun, but not allowed, and black is death. So <laughs> take your pick. Then, additionally to this, comes the risk appetite and possible consequences or techniques used to give you a tool. This intensity levels is actually a tool. So here on this level, we have legal, non-evasive, open source intelligence. That's level one. That's pretty cool. You can do that mostly without a problem. Without a problem, always looking over your shoulder and see if you get caught or not. And writing your letter and say, mom, I will be away for 10 years, but I will come back. Okay. It's simple local or national standard or corporations. It depends also on the company you work for. We can do the same thing for two different companies, but the risk is unbelievably higher on this company. If you have a company, I don't know, if you want to talk about, let's say, um, Monsanto, about pesticides, hell yes, do that. I look what you do. If you talk about something else with this company, pesticide with uh, Landi in Switzerland, it's okay. Those guys will kill you. So it also depends on the company. That's why you have the company in here there too, and the local or national as well. Level three is the preservation of a personal, of a person's or a company's integrity. That's, you can go up to level three with social engineering if you keep a person or a company's integrity. Don't smear them, don't make bad press for them, don't risk someone's job with it, then you're okay. Next levels, invasive, intrusive, medium complexity, international or well-known corporation. Five is ethically questionable. And six is the occasional risk of illegal misdemeanors activity, legal implications not known entirely. So, you know, think about it if you want to hack the Liberation Army or something like that, right? Level seven is invasive and intrusive, highly comp complex international company, high profile political, it's important or medially present. Then it goes all the way down. Here is coercion, etc. Illegal felonies, I will just explain you that, and misdemeanors. And the black stuff is highly illegal. That's usually reserved for these three letter acronym companies. We all know, right. So the point really here is oh, just about um, the felonies and the misdemeanors. I think in the Switzerland context, uh, it's really important that you know the difference. So I just look it up here that I'll tell you some crap. So misdemeanors is along the lines of Übertretung and Vergehen, and felonies is along the lines of Kapitalverbrechen, Straftat. You know, if you can't find a flat, you may do just a misdemeanor, gets you away a couple of months. If you produce a felony, can get longer. So think about it. Think about before you hack. This table is not just for hacking, guys. It's for social engineering, hacking, whatever else you do in life. You can apply it everywhere. It's important to know what you let yourself into, and 
It's actually part of the agreement with your client if you get social engineering contract. You put this table in, you both agree. You do social engineering based on physical entrance, blah, 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 locations, headquarters, very funny, 25 grand, but you stay within these levels and both sign this. That's important. So you have a common understanding what you do. So that's how the whole table looks like. Here are just a couple of comments, sign off approval. Because the point also with this table is, if you do red teaming, sending people somewhere, you won't see them for a while. You send them to Mogadishu, oh no, you won't see them at all, I guess, no. You send them to Sydney maybe, <laughs> and you say, guys, you're going to Sydney, you have to look at the corporate headquarters, red teaming, one month, expected results, you stay within level green. Off we go. Then when they're there, and they do their entering and breaking and whatever, they know they don't should go above level green. That's the point, because they go in there, they see a laptop with the golden image from the CEO, and it's like a jackpot. And at this moment, if you see something like this, you think, whoa, I, I have the jackpot, whoa. You go like this, and they take it with them, and then they fucked up the whole agreement, okay? If you agreed on this before, they just leave it there, do their job, and come home, okay? These things is especially important, as you can see here. If you engage third parties for the more risk bits, don't do them on your own. It's especially important to talk to them about this. It's their job. It's their job to stay here and do that and not more. That's how you do it in the professional world because you don't want to have surprises. That's really the thing no one wants, okay? So that's a table you agree beforehand with your team, with your red team, with your attack team, whatever the hell your team you call it, and say, guys, or guys, you can go up to here, okay? You can break a window, it's okay. You can steal something, it's okay. Don't do it in Kuala Lumpur, but you can do it in the US, okay? That's, that's why this table is for. Then maybe something a bit more boring from the engagement point, I won't go through all this here, but that's actually a complete set of what you do if you're self-employed or you want to become a social engineer, that's how you do it. So you have pre-engagement, engagement, and post-engagement phase. You do some processes here, very important ones, and you can use it. Usually, you have a framework, a project management framework, or you work with Hermes hmm, from the government in Switzerland. You don't need all the bits. That's why I show you the next bit, this one. These are the most important bits. It's only five. Client selection and acquisition. Look who you work for. Check them out. Scoping approach selection. I will show that just after this slide. The scope and the approach you take for your results. Deliverable and approach monitoring so your project doesn't go out of hand. Client job risk assessment. You know. If you work for a client, for instance, um, everything is fine, they get you a job, you think it's perfect, you do it, then you figure out, oh, your client is involved in some stuff like uh, killing orangutans for palm oil somewhere in Indonesia, you might think, oh, I'm a tool here. I don't have a job here. That's why this one is for. And I was with the big four. It was a very important point. Always keep track, not only of the job, but also of your client, I tell you. Otherwise, you will become a tool. Never mind, it's good stuff. And the GRC++, which I just showing you some elements. Now we go to the more meatier things, I think, which you can maybe relate more to it. That's the, the attack vector table. That's kind of the summary of it. And we have a, a range from standard attack vectors on this side to highly sophisticated targeted attack vectors. So here you can also see on this axis, it's based on the importance uh, of engagement or the importance of the task, but also it's based on effort and cost to develop an AV. 
I said, everything is a business. You, you can have, if you have time, develop the craziest attack vectors to get your results, but you won't get paid for it. <laughs> so it's always in this area. That's why you work in this area with the standard AVs. The standard AVs you know, and you see what you can do. So you work with OS Synth, a bit of dumpster diving, baiting, fishing, spear fishing, etc. And on here, you really have to specialize attack vectors. You, you won't find them anywhere else. We define them in safe. For instance, you can do psych profiling, you can use NLP techniques, you can do Gialdini 6, if you know what it is, uh, and SIR maps. SIR maps is actually something we invented. It's social and emotional relationship maps. It means if we look at a target person or a target object, we look how this person is related, not just from a networking perspective or from a social media perspective. We try to look at the person in a way, how does he react? What is his out of character behavior? What can we do with him else? He's, he's a, you know, this hate love relationships. Usually you won't go there because of ethical, does he have kids, family, what else? Is he healthy or not? I will show you that. And that can be pretty intense and obviously cost a lot of money. So you only do that if it's very important. But I will show you now after that, that one how this actually works. So here on this one, you see how we can develop attack vectors. And I'm not just talking about attack vectors. You're dreaming up after a night you were drunk and say, oh, that's a fucking good idea. It's engineering. Social, it's called social engineering, not social whatever. So that's the engineering approach in making attack vectors. And the point behind this, they are successful, they are predictable, and they do deliver the results. You know, it's a structured approach. And you see that's probably the most fun working on social engineering, working on these attack vectors. It's also very good if you have people in your team who are not maybe want to go out there and expose themselves, and always getting arrested at reception desks. Those guys can develop these. You need clever guys. You need guys who know how things work, how the world works, how company works, how accounting works. They can help you with this. You can even get specialized people in, like psychologists, for instance. You know, hackers have handles, system, system hands like frackers, etc. And psychology has system handles like Woodstock, Rainbow, etc. So get them in too. They can give you some valuable information. So you start with defining the type of AV you want to develop first. Technology-based, person-based, remote, on-site, or location-based. Then it's what I call the principle of the attack vector. We can basically use anything. I don't say this approach is the best. It's the same like with these tools. The framework actually accounts for we use what works and commercially works and the rest we get rid of it. It's the same here. I don't want to focus on a simple method or principle to develop these and in two years it's outdated. So we take what's out there. So we can use all these things. You maybe never thought you can make attack vectors out of it, but we can lose Maslow, hierarchy of needs. Maybe you have heard of it. We use Galdini 6. He has six principles defined in the book. They're good. Sometimes they talk in social engineering about parts of this stuff, but not really sorted, you know, not engineered. We have SIRMAP. We can use NLP techniques as attack vectors, you know, rapport building. Timing, leading, pacing, mirroring, doing the same as the person. You know, these are techniques for between people. We can use social media, we can use mice, money, coercion, etc. Curiosity or deception. And in there, you put in what you like or what you know. Maybe you know some voodoo technique, put it in here. I don't care. It's, you develop an attack vector. But it should be repeatable and it should be successful and then it should be bring the results you want. They can be time-based, authority, scarcity, helplessness. These are principles the human brain works. 
and has flaws. And depending on where you are, the flaws are different. That's the beauty. You cannot fix it, right? Then here, what you're looking for is actually sweet spots, weaknesses, strengths out of character, etc. Here are the constraints. You only get a certain amount of money to develop them or time. And you need to stay within the intensity levels or the GRC++. I will show you now three standard attack vectors, right? So here we have impersonation. Impersonation is actually the method, of course, of impersonating someone or something to gain access to a location or write a letter in the name of the CEO, etc., to get information, to get login information, or etc. That's basically what impersonation is. Then next you look at the intensity levels. Remember the 1 to 12. What's with the intensity level with this standard attack? It's a cool attack. Everyone loves it, dressing up and changing things. But the problem is it becomes quickly uncontrolled and it's more trouble than it's worse. Because depending what you do here, I think I got that for you um, on the next side. Here you got the answer. Most social media websites and other websites have an in-person policy or anti-impersonation or real name policy except if you're a celebrity. So with impersonation, you're already violating all that stuff. Then you have to be really careful. If you create a fictitious company and get in there, that's kind of probably okay. All these good ideas about, you know, get some overall from the cleaning company, whatever name they have. You can buy t-shirts at secondhand fairs with names and logos of companies. That can get complicated, right? Develop your own name, develop a fictitious company, and then refer to it. Because at a certain point, and it always depends how far you take it. Um, I know from cases where people also started doing fake IDs. You know, like I'm now the blah blah IT guy of do 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 to get in and get access and get connections and building identities. The problem with this in Switzerland, it's Urkundenfälschen. This. It's a felony. And how you want to risk felony for five grand or something? No. Don't do that. So impersonation, tricky thing. Good thing is dumpster diving. Social engineers love to dumpster dive. These are the rats of society, right? So they go through everything, everywhere. Buy stuff online. Go to the dumpsters. Have a look at them. Dig in. Figure out stuff and information. It's a cool thing. So you have to consider a couple of things here. Intensity level usually can be done within acceptable intensity levels if you have a clear understanding of what you do and where. You can take the bins out in the SBB, in the train station, but you have to be careful if you walk on someone's property. With dumpster diving, it's expected if someone throws something away, he has no real expectancy of privacy for these things. If these containers are on a company's property, it's different. You have to be a bit more careful. But usually, it's a good thing. And dumpster diving is, you can go do it everywhere. You find dump on hard disks, memory sticks, etc., as well as dump in physical form of paper. Eavesdropping, I think that's the best point. I say also usually as a joke to my friends, and I, I will do it, I promise you, I will do it one day. I say, if I travel first class in the train all around Switzerland, go to these first class lobbies in the airport, in the train station, there are even more every day. I can live from the information I will obtain there just by listening. This guy is saying, oh, quarter results are like this. Oh, we have to kind of get rid of our employees, blah, blah, blah. I always make a joke out of it. I think one day I will try it as a proof of concept. And I think it will work. I don't know how much money I can make, but I will be able to do. Because people are stupid. Privacy screens don't protect them from talking, you know? That's the biggest problem. From talk, no one applies the same 
um, principles as for documents. You have secret documents, you have this documents, vertraulich, etc. But they talk all crap. Dumpster diving, uh, eavesdropping is great. It's usually within acceptable levels, except you do wiretapping, but that's not even necessary. They say you anything. If you just talk to them and buy them a coffee. So, and it's mostly legal. That's a cool thing. That's what you need to get out of it. So train your ears and eyes. It's the best thing you can do. Let's go to the next one, Caldini. Caldini 6, he has just defined six principles. You have probably saw them. It's reciprocation, it's social proof, it's commitment and consistency, liking authority, scarcity. These are the principles in his book. Obviously, he didn't wrote it for social engineering. He wrote it for marketing, for making people comfortable, warm, fuzzy stuff. But of course, you can use everything, dual use, purpose. This is our description. If you will give, you will receive in return. If I do small favors, then you owe me a favor, right? When others are doing it, it's okay. Group pressure, peer pressure. If I agreed, I will stick to it. If you get a commitment from someone, you can take it maybe further. If it's like me, I like it, okay? If everyone walks around in t-shirt, I will walk around in t-shirt too. If an expert, that's an interesting point. If an expert or authority figure says it's true, then it's true. People don't even think between the first information they see on a website. I have put out graphics and stuff online with links in there, which would send them to some hellhole. I can tell you I got no feedback. They didn't even click on it. They don't even look at it. What is it? Is it true? Is the link true? Is it coming from there or not? That's unbelievable. If you're seen as a part of communicating, everything that's written must be true. And, of course, I make limited editions of everything. It's better. It gives you also another 10% of the budget. So, this is how it works. Attack vectors, reciprocation, you give, you expect back. I have to speed up a little bit. Social proof, how you apply it. It's all in the book. How do you apply this attack vector? That's the other one. That's this SIR map. It's a bit more complex. This is the index person. Psychologists use that. By the way, you can say you're a psych psychological advisor, but you cannot say you're a psychologist, okay? But the rest is fine. So you do this map, you put a person in the middle, index person. Now, description, what does this person do? That's a simplified example. He had an affair 2014 with 20-year-old Tiffany. He's now focused on Claire. He has best pal, Bob, has PTSD, is 45. He's married in 99 to Alice, which is 44. By the way, round is female, edgy is man. He has a hostile. He's host she is hostile towards Bob, sorry. So you collect this information. You can also give this to professionals to collect. Then you build an attack vector. And this one will hit, okay? You look for these things, emotionally loaded, incongruency, out of character, weak, underdeveloped, etc. This is a description. You have different, you always look for leverage with social engineering. You have your crowbar. You look where you can put it. And the human mind only needs little edges to put a crowbar and <coughs> crack it open, right? So you look for these things and you can use them then. I mean, that's very level six, right? You wouldn't do that just as it is. Here's a list of symbols you use, I can also give you those ones, but also you can use it for your meetings to draw how the real structure is of your company. This guy hates this one. This is the information maker, etc. You can use that. So, next one, big one, I think very important, ego. It's the biggest problem, me, myself and I. Why? Um, out of character. Ego makes you pay too much at an auction. Ego is also the problem why you have your antennas here on your backpack, where we can see it. Ego is a problem with your system handle. Do you really need one? Do you need to sign your work? Yeah, everyone needs. You know, graffiti audits do it. 
Hackers do it, social engineers do it, but eventually it will kill you, right? You know, everyone knows an, uh, an excel excellent hacker by name and handle and everything, but the absolutely outstanding hacker, no one knows. System hands are dangerous. Your behavior, your type of style, writing code, etc., is dangerous eventually, not now. It's here now. In a year, there's enough information to correlate all this and find the one who did it. So be careful with these things, with ego. It can give you a big struggle. So, a bit about distance and then we'll be finished soon. This is just uh, to tell you how things work. You have the intimate space, family, about an arm's length. Personal space, about two meters, it's friends. Social and public space. And then there's the bit we call reaction zone. So, that's about this. If you enter this space towards a person, it's the reaction zone. You will provoke a reaction of some sort. If it's military, you get shot. <laughs> if it's something else, you get hit. You provoke fight or flight. You need to know that. It's culturally different. You know, the Italians <laughs> fucking hug you. The French <laughs> kiss you everywhere. So it's different. But be aware of these things. What is, what is the zone? What is the comfortable distance? How do you talk to each other or sideways? Keep that in mind when you work with people, right? That's probably uh, the space of New York. <laughs> Everything cramped. You can ask your neighbor, can you change the song on my iPad or iPhone? This is then the practical application of this. This is a desk, by the way. That's your target person. You know, practical application. How do you approach someone? Guys, not from the back. It's never comfortable. The person will never talk to you. It's just not good. Red zone. Orange, somehow acceptable. Green is ideal. Talk to this and the screen is there to a person. Because then you have to make the person comfortable. If she's insecure or whatever, he will not talk. You don't have to social engineer everyone. It's also if you have employees or a team, consider this. But if you think, ah, oh, yeah, really cool, I go green, you go to the person's desk and sit on it, it's not working, right? That's an, <laughs> that's an aggression if you do that. So it's really just approaching the zones. Keep that in mind. So I think I'm, I'm finished with the parts I had, I could cover within this time, and if there are questions or you want to do something else, like a micro-expression training, just tell me. Are there any questions? You, you want to see the QR code again? <laughs> oh yeah, I can go back, sure. Hi, I just have a... A question. Have you ever felt uh, like in danger doing something in your in job? Yeah, I think definitely. <laughs> <laughs> or, or not comfortable. And it also depends what you do where, right? There are just certain countries or things you won't do anything. And that's the point in, in staying professionally. Or it's maybe if you do it in a team. If you team up, you do distractions or other things. I don't mean like explosions, but just, you know, uh, other distractions, then you feel uncomfortable because you cannot control the other persons. And then you think, oh my God, oh my God, this is going. So that's why these tables are here. You brief everyone beforehand and then you can trust. Uh, where is this code now? Uh, I think that takes risk out of it, but not the fun. But that's also why we in kind of invented this framework. So you can do it safely. You have your rules. You don't go to jail too long, I guess. You need good lawyers, but you're fine. And that gives you a good feeling, right? And the learning for companies, individuals, is anyway there way before you steal something or you break something or whatever. You can, you know, you can show the flaws or the gaps they have, I guess. Any other questions for Dominic? I miss the war stories in your talk. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're different ones. I mean, at, uh, at DEFCON, I was SCCTF uh, competition. 
like capture the flag, but for social engineering, I was there, it was really cool. And uh, then we had some assignments to do as well, in there, in Vegas. So some people just took it too far. So you get the job of go there and get their age, name, job, whatever, you know, kind of defined. And some took it so far that you took the approach of in a shop, telling a lady, okay, I'm with the police, I'm a private detective, I, ha I saw you stole something, right? And you need to show me your ID now. <laughs> okay, that's, that's an approach too. Approach selection was bad. And then she, she showed the ID and it was kind of, uh, do you really guys wanted to know it? Then they gave it back and the lady was running after them, right? Kind of, hey, who are you? Why do you want my ID? And that's kind of a thing in the US. It's not really good if you pose yourself as police or an authority. So they really got in trouble. I mean, it's always the friends that got in trouble, right? It's never you. You always have a friend who does it. You have a friend who knows it. So that's one of the stories I also came with these things up now. Okay, how do you can do the same thing but more risk averse? So, and always, uh, I guess you have to be careful. You can get closed up in a, you know, in the toilet and then you don't know how to leave the building afterwards. It was a great, good idea to hide yourselves, but uh, if you don't get out after it, it's not much good, right? And uh, there are these situations you think, oh, really, was it a good approach? And then there's no good way to talk yourself out of it. Usually what happens, you talk yourself into it. So <laughs> you need to know the point of no return, <laughs> where you say, all right, okay, I had this assignment, I tried it, um, you know, I give it, give your laptop back now, so sorry, sorry for installing a rubber ducky. It was just a proof of concept, so, but yeah, I, I don't do it again, but here, try this. You know, it's the other tool. <laughs> <laughs> but always play safe. So you can go to the next conference and you know, they're ending up in jail. They don't have TV there. All right, so let's give a nice welcome uh, applause to Dominic Cedric. Mm. Thanks.